Regina Basley, 瑞吉娜巴尔奇莱，美国麻省理工学院教授，自然语言处理和机器学习领域资深科学家 ，ACL Fellow, Triple AI Fellow, MacArthur Fellow. Regina 于2003年获得哥伦比亚大学博士学位，同年入职麻省理工学院，因为在 NLP 领域的出色研究。Regina 曾在2005年被麻省理工科技评论评为35岁以下科技创新35人之一。之后十多年，他带领自己的团队在人工智能领域深耕，并在 ACL、NAACL、EMNLP 等多个顶级会议上荣获最佳论文奖。2014年开始，团队的研究重心转向人工智能在医疗健康领域的应用，通过与医学院合作。他们在医疗数据处理、病理报告分析、X 光片诊断、淋巴瘤预测等方面取得多项重点突破。二零一九年 ，Regina 被评为药物发现和先进医疗领域 Top 一百 AI 领导者。Regina 教授的今天的报告题目呢是 Learning Molecular Representation。Let's welcome Regina. Hi, Regina. You can share your screen now. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear、Very、me?、Clear. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So first, I want to say my name is Regina. So、oh. this would be the first one. <laughs> It's Regina.、Uh, but at any rate, I am Regina Barzilai.、Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and for inviting me over. Um, um,、uh, so. Sorry. Uh, so uh, today I will talk about、uh, learning、um, chemical structure. So I didn't understand what was in this、uh, beautiful presentation、uh, that the conference organizers put together, but I did see that they mentioned the EMNLP in the other conferences. So、uh, you can guess that my original background is in natural language processing, and maybe five years ago, Tommy Yakala, who is another professor at MIT. And、um, myself moved to this new area of modeling、uh, chemical structure and molecular structure. And、um, the work that I would show you today encompasses a large group of our students at MIT. But I want to highlight one of these students,、uh, Wen Gongjing. He was actually the very first one who started working with us. Um, in this area, and lots of things that I will show today comes of his、uh, really amazing、uh, research. Uh, so, uh, talking about the field of chemistry and machine learning, so I'm sure that many of you in the audience are really,、um, you know, familiar with applications of machine learning to computer vision or to natural language processing. Chemistry is still more of a niche area. It's more.、Uh, it, it still kind of applies to a smaller subset of general machine learning community. But I want to share you with this、uh, slide that I've prepared, showing you how much this、uh, area grew in 2015. None of the top machine learning conferences had papers. On you know modeling molecules,、uh, and you can see that there is quite a number this year, and it continues to grow. So of course we are not cannot compete with like NLP papers yet in terms of numbers, but you can see it's very very steep growth, and I believe that this area would continue to grow. Uh, now. Um, I assume, and yeah, I cannot see you, so I don't know what are you thinking. But kind of, I believe that for the vast majority of you, it's a new area. So, first thing I want to say:、uh, do not worry. You don't need to know much about chemistry if you don't remember your high school chemistry. The only thing that you need to know is that a molecule is a graph. So, if you understand that part, then we are good and we can continue. Uh, the second point that I want to make when I was deciding how to structure this talk, I could have select few papers and talk in detail about these papers. Another alternative that I selected is actually to give you an overview of the field to highlight the opportunities and challenges, and to demonstrate where we can make a difference and which problems are still open problems. So many of you who are not working in this area can step in 
and uh, you know continue their research. People who work on graphs, uh, people who work on representations, and so on. So lots and lots of opportunities. Uh, so my talk encapsulates more than ten papers. Uh, so as a result. I will skip on some details, but there will be a reference to the paper, so you can always go back and, um, you know, check the papers. I will identify you the references um, in my talk. Okay, so um, what are the big questions when you are thinking about uh, modeling molecules? And modeling molecules is pretty essential, of course, for the pharmaceuticals. It's essential for people who do material design, green chemistry. Uh, until, you know, until today, and this is the truth, until today, whenever you are designing molecule, it's an art, it's an artisan art, where the idea is that um, you know, the human would have an intuition to find the molecule with this amazing property. And typically, you know which properties you want to have. You know, right now, we don't have a good antiviral against COVID-2. So you can say, I want to have a molecule which is good for COVID-2, uh, which is non-toxic, which is, has the right bioactivity, and so on. So you can kind of say, this is my desiderata. That's what I want to happen. And... Um, now I need to go and find it. And of course, you know, people who are experts in the field can do some of it, but most of the discovery today is driven by experimentation, uh, where people just really try and try and try, and you can say how much they can try. So if you're a big pharmaceutical company, you can maybe try million molecules uh, or few million molecules, but it's a combinatorial space, and we can only explore experimentally a tiny portion of it. So the hope is that if we develop strong machine learning models, instead of running this uh, expensive experimentation searching in the dark, we can actually predict these types of molecules. And typically this work is divided into two areas. The first one is called virtual screening. So in virtual screening, you are given universe of molecules. For instance, all the molecules that you can synthesize today, which will be hundreds of millions of molecules. And you want to identify, uh, to predict molecules with the highest desired property. Let's say you want um, antiviral against COVID. You want to identify which one of them is going to have this property. Uh, and this area, which is sort of mature, more mature, and already there are some concrete outcomes of this research that I would show you. And then there is this other area, uh, which is called de novo design. And this is kind of really an art. When you say, I don't only want to go through the existing molecules, which are big, but still, uh, you know, there's lots of possibilities. I actually want design a target molecule. I know which properties I want to have. I want to create from scratch the molecule which have these desired properties. So my talk is structured around these two tasks. So, and of course, you know, it makes sense to think about this virtual screening as discriminative task. And you can think of de novo design, this will be a generation task, okay? So, and for those of you who are less familiar with, uh, you know, maybe with uh, AI for drug discovery. In other areas, the question that you may be asking before we are delving into methods, are the methods actually mature enough? Uh, we know that you know, machine translation is mature enough. We're using machine translation on the daily basis or speech recognition or image search. So how mature are these techniques? And I want to share you one of the results that comes from MIT. This is a collaboration of many people. Uh, from myself and Tommy Yackel and our students on the computer science side and also people in biological engineering um, like John Stokes and uh, Professor Jim Collins, where we utilize this virtual screening technique to discover a new antibiotic. And here you can see it, they call it Halicin. And it was published in Cell, which is a top biology journal in February and, and got a lot of attention. So what was special about this molecule uh, is that it can treat multiple uh, pathogens which are resistant to, con to traditional drugs for which there is no good cure. And to make it more remarkable, this particular molecule could also has a new biological mechanism of action. And uh, 
the area of antibiotic discovery, like we got for, into it because I really wanted to try and see does our model do something productive, but this is an area where machine learning can make really a huge difference um, because for various reasons, and I will not get into them, pharmaceutical companies pretty much walked out of their antibiotic discovery, so they are not investing in it. And if you're looking historically, and here you can see the map, uh, in the last 30 years, there was very little new discovery of antibiotic, despite the fact that there is increasing, increasing um, uh, resistance and lots of people are dying because there are no good uh, antibiotic. And even if we're looking at the COVID case, multiple studies demonstrated that people who actually died out from this disease, many of them developed very severe pneumonia, um, bacterial pneumonia, uh, and, uh, you know, be treated. Um, so what you know, machine learning can bring here is that you can actually do a lot of in silica screening. It's very cheaply. We did it with like no budget almost. You can do the screening, you can identify the candidates and then try them. So what we've done in this case, uh, we um, you know, took uh, a model, trained the model, and I would explain to you how this model works during the talk, uh, uh, to predict the antibacterial activity and identify a small set of candidates which were then tested in the lab and tested on animals. So specifically, the way you generate training data, and this is a different type of training data that we get in natural language or we get in... Um, uh, you know, computer vision. Uh, here, you know, Jonathan Stork, who is a postdoc, went to the lab and he took uh, cells infected with the bacteria, uh, put the molecule and see whether it inhibit growth of the bacteria or not. So um, if you want to have your training set of 2,500 molecules, that's what he had, he need to take, you know, 2,500 cells with different molecules and see what happens. So at the end, what we get, uh, and I should say, I never been in the lab, so I don't know how he's done it, though we have some pictures. What we get on our end, we get molecular structure, 2D graph, and a number. And this number reflects how much killing effect does this molecule have on the, um, uh, on the pathogen of interest. And, um, you know, and, and what you can do, Okay, there is a call from China. Let me see. Hello? I'm not sure. Is there a, a problem with my presentation? Is there something wrong? Somebody, speak up. You cannot hear me, you cannot see me. I speak too fast. Anybody? Hi, Regina. I think your presentation is still in the title page. We cannot see any oh new Oh my slide. God. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is good that you told me. Okay. So let me, uh, can you see it now? I don't know what's go wrong with the Zoom, but I was moving the slides and I assume that you've seen it. So this is the graph that I was presenting you. This is the slide that I was showing you with this drag. Um, so I yeah, was just showing you. Slide now, but you need to uh, uh, put it on the screen. What do you mean? Put it on the screen? It's already on the uh, screen. You need to play. You need to play. Sorry. Oh, so the, the problem is never. I, I discovered that there is something funny with my Zoom or with Keynote and Zoom that whenever I do that, if I do play, it's gonna stuck on this slide. And I oh, try. I it. see. I'm gonna be wasting the time. Yeah, but we can say that now. It's okay. Yeah. I'm sure okay. you can see it. So we're not going to waste time on this. Uh, okay, so sorry, didn't know, but uh, because to me it was moving. I didn't know that it's not moving for you. Uh, so sorry. So let me just go very fast from what I was describing you. So luckily we caught it early. So this is a molecule. And uh, again, what we've got here was this, um, you know, what he did, he did computed the growth inhibition. And what we got, that's what the most important part of us is on the AI side, you got these 2D graphs with the measurement of the efficacy. And uh, what you can do next, you can actually train the model that given these measurements of molecular inductivity can predict uh, how you know, active against some pathogen is your molecule, okay? So you have, um, so you train it on a given set when you knew whether the molecule inhibits or doesn't inhibit the growth 
of let's say E. coli, which is one of the pathogens. And then if you train the model, you can take now a new molecule and predict the outcome. So uh, uh, de facto, what are we doing here is uh, the task that I told you, it's in silica screening. Uh, we run the model on uh, uh, hundreds of millions of molecules and we identify a subset of promising molecules which were tested or in the lab on animals and what this result shows um, is that against uh, two bacteria for which today there is no treatment, if you get one of those, you really are in a bad shape, like A. Baumani and C. difficile. Uh, this bacteria, this, this particular drug work very well in mice models. Uh, that's how they test the stuff. Uh, so, um, as you can already see that these models are delivering some benefits. Um, so the next question for us is what can we do with our methodology to make it even better, okay? So that's the part that we actually start thinking about how AI can change the game here. Okay, so early approaches that try to use AI and they started maybe in 90s or something, they tried to use AI in chemistry had the following idea. How can I take my 2D graph and summarize it into a feature vector to do my machine learning? So the way it was typically done, it's called something like molecular fingerprint. You take the 2D graph and then you summarize it into a vector where each coordinate would represent some chemical substructure, like for instance, a ring or something else. Now you can say, how do you know which substructures to use, which ones are important? And that's exactly where chemical expertise came in and people um, utilize it to, um, you know, um, to decide what are the important substructures in the molecule. And obviously it was problematic because maybe for different properties, whether you're looking at toxicity or bioactivity, you need to have a different set of substructures, but um, you, um, you, know, you wouldn't know. And these models were really not performing very well. So the new idea that came in, which is not a big surprise for all of us who work in neural networks, is that instead of creating this fixed uh, human design representation, you can take the molecule and um, learn uh, to compress it into a vector uh, from which you can predict the activities. On the positive side, now you can summarize the molecule into a different vectors depending um, what type of um, property do you want to predict. On the negative side, you lost your interpretability because now you don't know what the first coordinate corresponds to, but we don't care because we just want to predict, correct? And I will talk more to you and give you an example how exactly this representation can be constructed. But let me first give you kind of a high level view where we are driving with it. The hope is that if I took my 2D uh, graphs, my molecules, and I abstracted them into some high dimensional space, we hope that this space has the right geometry, that the molecules which have um, uh, you know, similar property, like have, let's say they have similar solubility, they will be together, and the molecules which have different property value, they will be farther apart, okay? So in other words, what we kind of assume that the distance in the embedding space is actually representative to the distance in property values. And the whole arc, can you actually construct it? Can you do the abstraction in such a way that um, this assertion is true? So, uh, and, um, you know, the systems that we build, and it's broadly used in pharmaceutical industry, and it's used kind of uh, as a competitor in many papers. Uh, it's called Chemprobe, it's publicly available. And um, last year, last, we wrote a paper where we actually really, there was a big dilemma in chemistry community. Our land representation actually better than fingerprints because every company has its own fingerprints and they were trying to assert that, they, you know, if you're really experienced, you can do better. So we run 850 experiments. You can see here two students who did it, Kevin Young and um, Kyle Swanson. And we demonstrated that land representations really overall do better. 
but you can also do a hybrid architecture where you combine both land representation and the fingerprints. It helps especially on the smaller data sets. I should say that before my talk, I discovered this paper that actually comes from China. It comes from uh, Tsinghua and Tencent. Um, that currently does better. I think it's the first paper that shows that they can do better than Campro by uh, changing the uh, architecture of the neural net. And I'm sure there is a lot of place where by, you know, doing different architectures, you can, um, you can improve. However, what I want to do now um, in this part of the talk is actually not talk to you about like, you know, changes in the architecture, like we can do a lot of changes and of course it is important but more to talk to you about like open areas where i think we really need to think very hard as a community to provide solutions uh, and i want to start with the first one is a representation capacity so what do i mean by representation capacity you know this 2d graph actually represents something about molecule it represents a lot of um, quantum mechanics and other things are the representation which we all merit to, which is a graph neural nets, are they the ones? You know, is it the right way to move forward? So let's just look how we can use graph convolution today. And, you know, all the models that are out there use this idea in one way or another. Um, let's just look how it is done. So the way it is done, you start with looking at the molecule as a... Mm, you know, as an atom, uh, as a combination of atoms, and you represent every atom as a vector. And this is like a fixed value of the vector. For instance, you can remember what is the type of the atom, you know, what is its degree, how many neighbors does it have, is it in a ring, and so on. So this should be really trivially computed from the, um, from the molecule itself, from the atom itself. And then the next step comes, like usual in graph convolution, is we start doing message passing. So I have my own vector, my neighbor uh, atoms have their vectors, and then we um, learn how to combine them together in such a way that we optimize our final prediction. So after doing this kind of message passing within one hole, I will know my own information as an atom, but also the information from all um, my neighbors. Uh, and if I continue doing it eventually, because all the atoms are updated at the same time, eventually information for two hopes, three hopes, and so on is propagated to me. So every atom at the end of this process would keep uh, kind of its local environment information as well as its own features. But here something interesting happens. So now I want you to pay attention. So what happens next? So now every atom, every atom has its own vector. What do we do next in graph convolution? How do we go from this atom representation to the molecular representation? We do something real funny. We just sum them up, correct? We sum them up and then we call it our molecular representation. And of course we need to do it because we need to somehow summarize the information. But the big question is, is it the best way to move forward? Because you can imagine that there can be very different, uh, you know, um, sets which would have the same sum, but they would look very different that you can see here in my slide. I hope you can see it, uh, that we have very um, different sets, but they still have the same, uh, you know, the same sum. So the point is that whenever we are doing this compression at the end, it's very simplistic summary. And we are losing a lot of information by doing this, um, you know, representation. So um, um, one way to solve it, and I'm not sure it's an optimal way to solve it, is to move to a richer way of combining it. And now I'm presenting the work done by Benson Chen and Octavian Ganea. Um, and uh, this was a recent submission to Neurips. It's, um, you can find it on archive, uh, where we are looking at a different way of combining the information with Wasserstein prototypes. So what I want you to think is that we are taking our space and now it will be represented by four prototypes. For simplicity, which would be sets of atoms. For simplicity, you can think that each prototype is molecule, but in reality it is not a molecule, it just learns set. So you have four prototypes and then um, when a new molecule comes in, uh, which is again sets of atom, you translate it into a vector by looking at its distances from all the other prototypes. 
And this way, you can in much more refined way to represent different molecular structure. And you empirically can see that this is indeed the case looking at the latent space. So what you see here in the latent space, okay, this is, a, of course, 2D projection of the embedding, and the color represent the property. So what I told you earlier, what we call that when we're building our geometry, that the closed areas uh, have the same values and the distant areas have different ones. And you can see that when we're looking at the latent space constructed through this Wasserstein's prototypes, it's kind of slowly goes from dark green to lighter yellow. However, if you're using normal graph convolution, you can see uh, all over the place, you can see that there is really non-smooth changes in the values of the um, uh, property. Uh, another point related to representation, and this is Wen Gong's work, um, related to the structural um, motifs. And what I mean by that, that, you know, whenever I look as computer scientists in the molecule, I just see a graph. What chemists see when they look at the same molecule, they actually see this subgrouping, the same way when you're looking at the English sentence or Chinese sentence, you know, it's so like you are seeing individual characters, you're actually seeing words, and that's what helps you to interpret it. That's how chemists look at it. Um, uh, that there are bigger building blocks from which the molecule is constructed. And in his most recent paper, um, it's, I think it's ICML, um, uh, Wing Gong demonstrated how you can do encoding which um, learns to learn these building blocks and to assemble them together where the, this encoding really preserves this hierarchical representation. And, uh, and we can see empirically that doing this kind of reasoning at the hierarchical level is really important and you can really improve your performance. It becomes even more important if you look at big molecules like polymers. So kind of understanding and borrowing some ways of how chemists think about these graphs can be very helpful. I just want to say one sentence um, related to um, an open question, and I think it is really an open question in this field, is what to do with 3D representation. Because, you know, these molecules are really 3D. Uh, you know, whenever you talk to a chemist, they always say, you know, you need to include 3D information. As far as I know, I didn't see a result that demonstrates that using, you know, 3D information, um, really outperforms uh, what is available there with 2D. I don't think that it's a wrong idea. I think that we still don't know how to do it effectively. But let me move forward and talk to you about another very important topic, which is generalization. So what do I mean here by generalization? Like typically, and I talked a lot about people in pharmaceutical industry, and there was my first lesson when I moved to, to this area, was the way I thought about how we do train development test split was the way I do it in natural language processing. I take a corpus, I randomly split it to training, to <coughs> development and test, and we are done. Actually, what these people care about is not to do that. What they want to do is to separate the data based on the scaffold. Scaffold is like a backbone of the molecule. So what you want to do, uh, you want to have your test to be really different from your training. And the reason they want to do it, because you know maybe they screen molecule for one therapeutic target, now they want to move to another target. They really want to know what happens in a new part of chemical space. <coughs> And here you can see, for instance, the data visualization of the data that we use for antibiotics discovery. You can see that the data which we used for training the model that he collected when he manually screened is all in blue. This is training, but you can see different chemical libraries on which we eventually apply this model. You can see that Wuxi library, which is green here. Um, uh, I hope I pronounced Wuxi correctly. Um, is really different. And of course, you make much more mistakes the farther you are from your training. So in chemistry, it's really important to be able to operate when there is a, you know, when your training lives in one part of the space and you're testing it on another part of the space. So you really want 
to be able to generalize. So in um, so and uh, Win Gong um, wrote his new paper, the main extrapolation via regret minimization, where he tries exactly to achieve this goal by um, uh, extending uh, um, invariant risk minimization framework. And the idea here is that you can, you know, kind of force your algorithm to generalize beta by creating these artificial environments, which will represent, you know, groups of molecules, which let's say have different scaffolds. So you can say, I'm going to somehow break my all the my area, uh, my, my whole training set into a subsets where one subset is, has really different scaffolds than the rest. And here you can see an example where you know, training set one has scaffolds that contains two, ring, two rings and training set doesn't have such examples. Okay, and the idea behind this regret minimization is the following, that um, you train uh, your classifier, which learns uh, the molecular representation from which you do predictions, and you want to make sure that um, whenever you are training without seeing this held out domain, and whenever you are training with this oracle domain, when you actually have access to this domain, uh, your regret is minimal, uh, meaning uh, that your difference between the mistake that you make whenever you haven't seen um, anything from this domain versus you had full access to this domain, you want to minimize um, this, uh, the difference in errors. And um, the part that I'm kind of skipping over, there is actually a very interesting uh, part of his paper in how to think about how to define these domains because in case of chemistry, uh, you know, this uh, scaffolds a tree, so it's a combinatorial problem. He has very smart way of uh, developing, uh, you know, dynamic environments based on perturbations. But I just want to show you that this method, how amazingly well it worked in a very difficult scenarios where he, um, you know, for instance, split his data sets in a very challenging way based on the molecular weight, where you have training with very small molecules, validation with the bigger molecules, and test with much higher molecules. And you can see that there is a significant improvement using this uh, 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 training, uh, this sort of training. And um, he also got really good results on COVID data, where you have here heterogeneity in terms of, you know, not the weight of the molecules, but in terms of what kind of coronavirus you are using for training and testing. So he trains on coronavirus one, SARS one, applies it to testing, and again we see uh, very significant gains. So now I want to talk to you, and I hope somebody in this audience um, will address this problem because this problem was annoying me for many, many years. And they still don't have a solution. And I don't think there is anybody who has a solution, even though they may claim they do. So as we all know that, you know, here it's a beautiful picture from computer vision that, you know, whenever you are training on a small data, typically your performance really goes down and it sucks big time. So what we do in, uh, again, in computer vision or in natural language processing, we do pre-training when we take data, some large data that we are available, we pre-train the model and then we apply it uh, you know, to our domain of interest. And I'm sure that all of you have seen these graphs about uh, pre-training in NLP, that um, there is a benchmark called Blue Benchmark, which has 11 different tasks. And you can see what a huge difference did pre-training make that you, you know, increase like over 20 points in performance because you did pre-training on a large amounts of data. Now, this idea seems to be very easily translatable to chemistry because, you know, you have billions of molecules out there. So, like, what's the big problem? You know, you, you have molecules. You can just take the ideas from NLP and directly translate them the same way as we do, you know, uh, mm, predicting the word. Instead of predicting the word, you can predict an atom or you can predict the neighborhood and you can train your model. And um, the funny part is that it really doesn't work. And you know, people show tiny performance improvement, few points here and there, nowhere close to what we see in NLP and vision. And we try very hard at MIT 
to make it work. Uh, so far, we haven't succeeded. Um, I don't understand why it doesn't work. And um, I really hope that somebody in the audience, you, you know, that somebody would uh, look closer into this area because this is an area where it's really super important to utilize the data because you pay so much for the training data. So if you can somehow utilize all this raw data available, this would be really a huge gain. So another topic that I want very briefly to mention, uh, and I would not go into huge details, but um, this is an area which is very specific to chemistry, which doesn't really show up in NLP and computer vision. And this is confidence estimation. I know it sounds like super boring, like who cares? But in chemistry, people do care. Because if you run, and I've seen it on, you know, in my small experience with drug discovery when we discovered halicin, you have your model. You, mod you run it on, you know, you on hundreds of millions of compounds. Now it gives you thousand compounds that the model believes that they are very active. Uh, since you have a limited budget, okay, every molecule may, may cost up to a few thousand dollars to buy, it takes time, you need to decide which molecules you're actually going to buy. How are you going to, can you trust the model, you know? And you can say, okay, I'm just going to use the uh, probability of my uh, predictor, doesn't work very well. And there is a lot of work uh, in chemistry because it's so important to know how confident you are in your prediction that people have tried to do it. For instance, the way they do it, they compute the distance of the test molecule from the train molecule, either in observed space, that is like tiny motor similarity which compares graphs, or in embedding space. Uh, you can do ensemble methods. When you see if you run different ensembles, how much they agree. There are um, methods that explicitly predict the variance. Lots of different things. Um, so we just now put on archive a paper by uh, um, Kyle Swanson and Leon Hirschfeld that demonstrates that we took these methods and we tried them on many data sets. And what we found is very, very concerning. So if you look at the place which is called Delani, it's one of these data sets, we're talking here at the arrow. So the lower, the better. How can you see if your confidence estimator works well? If it works well, uh, if you take top five most confident molecules, you should be doing much better than taking the whole data set. So that's what we did. The big red bar uh, shows the, the arrow if you take the whole data set. Um, the blue shows if you talk top 10% and the purple shows top 5%. So what you see, this is a perfect scenario. That's what you hope this model will do. However, if you go to another data set, which is called LIPO, in this case, it actually goes in an opposite direction. If you are selecting the most confident molecules, your performance actually goes down. So the point is, it really doesn't work. And this is a question we just submitted, I didn't reference it here, um, a paper to NeurIPS about confirmer prediction. And I think there is really a lot of place to think how you do selective classification. How do you develop deep learning models which only predict when they are confident or you have an ability to say no uh, when you are not, not to say no, to say I don't know. So there is another like different different space to think about. And the final point that I wanted just to mention very briefly, uh, it's called mechanism understanding. Uh, so um, I, I'm not sure if this conference uh, featured people uh, for, who do interpretability, but you know, interpretability became really, really hot topic in uh, NLP and computer vision. And the way we're thinking typically about interpretability, you know, I give you a review which is positive, you're going to highlight me which parts of the review are positive, which subsection. I give you a radiology image or mammogram, and you're going to highlight me where is the cancer. So here, when I think about interpretability, I think in a slightly different way. We, meaning me and other computer scientists who are solving these chemistry pro problems, we are making an assumption. I give you a graph and I give you a number. I don't give it them. Uh, where does it come from? You know, that's what I'm going to learn. But in reality, it's very mechanistic. You know, the reason something is toxic 
you know, biologists will give you exact explanation why something is toxic or not toxic, what exactly happens, to which target it attaches, uh, what is the mechanistic knowledge. And I will tell you, in our paper for cell, our computer science part took maybe, I don't know, a few weeks of work. What took very, very long time after we even identified this molecule was um, identifying the mechanism, how exactly this molecule kill the pathogen. That's what took a long, long time. And my hope is that we eventually are going to develop models uh, for chemistry, which are not only telling us, give us prediction, but also can spell out the mechanism and have access to this biology to tell us why things are happening uh, rather than just giving an answer. I don't know any papers that currently do it, but um, actually when Gong is looking into this area, and I think it's very promising area to look into. So just to summarize, those are the areas, the presentation capacity, how do we generalize, how we do uncertainty estimation and mechanism understanding are really big uh, questions in, um, uh, in, unset in uh, property prediction. And I should tell you that ChemProp is used at least in 10 pharmaceutical companies now and in uh, companies like BSF, which produced, you know, chemicals. So it really spreads out. It becomes more and more common. So whatever you do here and improve the accuracy, uh, you can really impact both human health and ecology and many other areas. So in the remaining 10 minutes of my talk, um, I want to talk to you a bit about de novo design. Uh, so until now, I was making an assumption, I have this big world of molecules and I just want to pick up some. But, you know, what if you want to design something new, you know, which never was in the list in the first place? Um, so, and again, you see the picture of Wing Gong. So again, the goal here, maybe, somebody gives you, it's called lead optimization. Somebody gives you a molecule which kind of does something, not great, and you want to improve it. You want to create another molecule which have better properties, okay? And here I again want to talk to you about um, what happens when you take the techniques from computer science, developed for a different field and just applied them blindly. And that's what happens in this paper. This paper has like millions of citations, maybe not millions, but thousands. And uh, what it does, this paper makes the following assumptions. It's really kind of the idea comes from like classical uh, computer vision. So you're going to take the molecule, okay, map it into this, uh, you know, hidden latent space, then you're gonna optimize it. Let's say you have a property predictor, you're gonna optimize it in the hidden space, and then you're gonna generate a better improved molecule. This was uh, the, the idea. Um, in other words, if I'm to draw it to you, again, we are in a latent space, we encoded our molecule in a latent space, we have a predictor which we optimize, you know, with stochastic gradient descent, we get to some point, and then we can go and do decoding and generate. The problem is this really, really doesn't work very well. And why it doesn't work very well? Um, I mean, I should say that people who did it, they were the first one who thought about it. They were the first one to demonstrate it, so we should give them credit. But why we can do better? And the reason we can do better and the reason it didn't work really well, because this hidden space, as I was alluding earlier, is extremely non-smooth. You know, so this kind of picture that I draw is like a picture from, from a cartoon that I believe that if I go up, I'm going to get somewhere. The space doesn't look like that. And we show a lot of things to demonstrate that it doesn't look that way. And um, the question is how you can still do optimization in its very non-smooth, complex space. So um, there were several key ideas that we utilize to achieve it. One is, I sort of described you earlier, is to actually move to encoding like junction trees, to do more hierarchical encoding, it really helped. The second idea uh, comes from utilizing thoughts from machine translation. Because you remember, maybe like just starting with initial point, then optimizing and then generating, it's really, really unconstrained, really hard, lots of places to make mistakes. So instead, you can imagine yourself 
that let's say I have my training set where I have molecular property, molecular property. So what I can do, I can identify pairs of molecules, not identify, just take pairs of molecules, which are close to each other, which have different properties. So what I can do this way, I'm like creating a machine translation parallel set where I start with a original molecule and then I have a close neighbor which have improved properties. So you can think about it as a standard machine translation pipeline. Uh, when uh, you have the beginning molecule, you have the end molecule, and then you can learn encoder and decoder. And this architecture seemed to work uh, reasonably well, um, quite well. And um, since I have um, how many minutes? Five minutes. So I would show you I will tell you why it didn't work. And this is um, the very last, latest you know, uh, uh, paper from uh, uh, ICML from Van Gogh that got, you, you can read it online, but it's really a, a cool idea and I want to finish my talk with it. So the main challenge, what I told you about machine translation that you can learn it, it's good if you just care about one property because then you can construct this molecule. But what if, I want now to create a molecule which have 20 properties of interest, which typically happens in pharmaceutical industry, but I have never observed any of these positive variants. I've never seen them, you know? I've seen molecules with one property, I've seen the set of molecules with another property, but I've never seen a target which have all these 20 different properties. What do I do? I cannot apply this technique. Um, if we, I never seen examples. So, um, Wing Gong uh, developed this method, which is actually quite close to how chemists are thinking about it. The way chemists are designing molecules, they kind of know that if you want to get certain behavior, there are part, there are some functional group that will deliver some subgraph that will deliver you this behavior. And you want some other behavior, you get another subgraph. And then you need to put them together to create good molecules. So what Will Gong did, he designed a strategy which has two steps. The first one is rational extraction. So it's like interpretable model. If some of you know work of Tao Lei, so it has some inspiration from that work. Um, what you're going to be doing, you're going to be training your model to predict the property, let's say uh, solubility. You're going to train your model, but in addition to making prediction, you would also learn what is the subgraph that drives this property? What is the rationale that drives this property? So once you've done that, for every property, you're going to have a set of substructures that are correspondent with this property. So in other words, if you're doing natural language, it would be close to you know, the words like beautiful and like and whatever if we're doing sentiment. And then... Uh, now I say, I want to create molecule with 20 property. You say, fine, I am going to go to each one of the pieces that represent these 20 properties and put them together um, to a coherent molecule. So in this case, he shows you example with two properties. So there is a red one and the blue one. So this is a rationale for some uh, GNK3 inhibitor. This is some other inhibitor. And if you want to create a molecule which have two of these properties, you're just going to learn how to put them together and add some fillers in between to uh, get uh, to desired outcome. And the rational extraction he does with a Monte Carlo tree set, you can look at the paper. And whenever you are learning how to put the big chunks together, you actually don't need properties. You can just take valid molecule break them into pieces and learn how to assemble them well. And with this approach, I encourage you, those who are interested to look at this paper, it really demonstrates that you significantly improve the accuracy. So for instance, what you can do now, and he actually done it, it's an example he just put in the camera ready of ICML paper, is an example if you want to create a narrow spectrum antibiotics. For those of you who ever took antibiotics, you know that the problem with them, that they kill the bug that they care to kill if they can, but they would also kill a lot of other good things in your body. So what you want to do, you want to say, I want you to kill this, but leave everything else alive. So you can imagine there are many properties where you say, I don't want you to act on this pathogen, but I want you to act only on this one. So using this particular technique, he created molecules which are antibiotics with narrow spectrum.
Um, and uh, I think I have one minute to finish. And again, I want to finish it with this graph. This is a fast growing area. And in contra and what we've seen so far, the, the best models in this area, they are actually algorithmically created. It's not about taking CNN that was developed, you know, for images and putting it in molecules. Every single time we see that the models, the new algorithm, the new development really do change the performance. Of course, they have ideas that are developed in general machine learning community. But I think this is really a big space of opportunity and it also enables us as a computer scientist to make an important societal impact. So with that, I would like to thank you. And I don't think I have time for questions. Thank you, Regina, right? <laughs> Regina, Regina, we'll end it, Regina. <laughs> okay, I, I think uh, Professor Fazle show a lot of examples when we apply the familiar tools from machine learning to an other field. And it's very powerful. Uh, I think it's there, there, not yeah. exactly uh, yeah. what I meant to say. It's not from other fields. I was trying to say that it's not a good idea. And we've seen that people who try, that's how people yeah. start. They took the field tools and apply. Yeah, and yeah. those are not good models. Those are baselines. Yeah, I I, I can't agree with you anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe uh, that uh, we uh, I, I think as uh, machine learning experts, machine learning uh, students, we have powerful toolkit, very powerful. You can use them to apply uh, to do. Uh, very interesting things, yeah. So, uh, Regina, can you see the chat room in Zoom? There are several, yeah, yeah questions for you. You you can choose, choose choose one or two as you will. Yeah, I'm just going one by one. Uh -huh. How do you like this phenomenon? You know, how to solve it? Current your policy research in fantasy supervision will be quite controversial. Um, are facing a lot of challenges. Um, uh, how, in the, the, the search space is very, can you use molecular representation to show how to recover molecule from molecular representation? Let me go with a more technical question. Mm -hmm. So the question that I would answer, uh, that I would answer because I understood it better. Um, so in the task of retrosynthesis, the search space of reactants is really huge. Can you use molecular representation to swing such space? So the problem of retrosynthesis, it's actually a uh, classical reinforcement learning problem. I didn't talk about it, but um, um, it's really where machine learning already makes a big difference. So the, the idea is that I give you a molecule, okay? I give you a molecule. You have a library from which is that you can buy. And it is your job to tell me which molecule should I combine? How I run my reactions to get to my molecule? So you can imagine that you do three. So you combine two reactants in certain temperatures and you add something else. So you get this kind of retrosynthesis tree. And typically what is given is a target, which molecule to generate, and the, um, uh, you know, the library, the ingredients. But there is like exponential number of possible ways to generate it, which will have different efficacy, and different properties. And again, until now it was done by humans, maybe not very effectively. For the last few years, people start using a lot of machine learning here. And the challenge is that the space's possibilities is combinatorial. How do you do it? So the, there are two different approaches. One approach is what you just said earlier, uh, just to take what is available. In this case, people said, okay, um, you know, I can represent molecules as strings and then write, uh, run transformers, which would predict, you know, if you do one step, you want to predict which reactants will generate this molecule, you can just write it as a standard um, kind of transformer architecture and you would get some outcomes. The approach that we advocated, actually, this is a paper that we put an archive and I think now, at least as far as I know, we get the best results. Maybe somebody already got better results. But the idea is, again, to use chemistry. Because what you know about retrosynthesis is that if you take to, so of course, if you want 
to do full modeling and, and look at the full space of possibilities, too large, you cannot really handle it. But if you're saying that what chemistry people know, that whenever you are put two molecules together to generate the third one, you typically change very few bonds in the graphs. Most of the graphs are used um, and actually, the machine learning problem is not to do full-fledged generation. Machine learning problem is just to identify which pieces change and how they come together. So if you do this reformulation and you focus on identifying these big co-units and how to fuse them, you can dramatically cut uh, you know, the, the candidate space and make it much more effectively. So we have a paper uh, with Vinesh Ram uh, that is on archive that demonstrates how to do this architecture. And here, again, the chemistry insight that you are only making a small change, building the model around it, really, um, really important. And the molecular, of course, and using molecular representation here plays quite, uh, quite a bit of role. So there is another question that is about that I just want to answer. And um, talking about, I think it's really important in the chemistry space, and I think it's really an impediment for people in AI uh, that we can only work in the areas where the public data is available. This data is extremely expensive. So an example of how I think pharmaceutical industry and other industry are currently shooting themselves in the food and failing is that, you know, everybody almost who work in, if you look at iClear, New Reef's paper and so on, they work on small molecules. Why do they work on small molecules? Because you don't have any data on peptides or on large molecules publicly available in quantities needed for us to do something. So it's great that they have this collection within the pharmaceutical company, but unless we have access to this data, unless we have a benchmark methods and we know the improvement, this is very problematic. So I think it's really important for us as a community really to push, to bring the best of, of our area, um, which is benchmarking, which is doing proper comparison and reproducibility and like pushing our partners to make the data set available for all is really, really important. And, you know, and we are trying to do it because I think that when this field started, and like as machine learning, they took some of the kind of archaic ideas where everybody does their method and reports it on their own set so we cannot compare. So I think that now there is a big change and change is coming. Okay. Yeah, Regina, maybe in the future we can have some cooperation about uh, maybe the data, uh, the algorithm. Yeah. And, uh, indeed, also indeed. More exchange. Yeah. Sounds great. Bushi yeah. is actually one of the big partners, correct? Yeah. I mean, they are collaborating with us and I think they are really interested and have capacity to generate data and to use machine learning algorithms. They do. Yeah. Because in, in BAAI, we, we have uh, many task, tasks about uh, collecting the data and uh, building good data sets in various uh, fields. Yeah, Professor Tang, you know, he is the guy to, to do this uh, task. Tang Jie from okay. Tsinghua University. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> sounds yeah, sounds great. There's, there's another uh, a new new question. Yeah, I see. It's about the future of NLP. Oh, NLP. <laughs> this is fine. We do NLP as well. So I think. You know, like people always ask me, why did I start doing chemistry? Um, like I got there pretty randomly, but one thing that excites me about chemistry is there are lots of unsolved problems and there are a lot of technical challenges and you cannot just take transformer and run it on it and hope for the best. It just doesn't, because there are different structures, you can really incorporate a lot of knowledge. What a bit frustrates me now in natural language processing, that if you're looking at the whole bunch of papers that are submitted to ACL, we are seeing you know, one or two dominant architectures, and then the rest of the paper would be simple permutation on this dominant architecture, which reports some empirical results. I mean, empirically, of course, it is important, but I feel that because we have very powerful tool, in some ways it's negatively impacts the community because you can get good results without really, you know, moving away 
from uh, the standard architectures. However, in NLP, and for those of you who are trying to build practical system, know it better than anybody else, that you have the huge, like, like uh, pre-training of course made a huge difference and it really enabled us to do, to work with the smaller data sets. But still, the amount of annotations that we require today is prohibitive. And if you want to move it to a new data set or to new task, it's like how much data you can create. Our ability to transfer when we are writing transfer and showing, you can, we always have enough 5% improvement, but this 5% typically come from, you know, 70. So you still don't do very well. And if, you know, I collaborate with the company and I tell them, you know, what are your options? I say, okay, just pay for more annotations. You can always improve it further. Uh, so I think one of the big challenges, and I hope that the natural language community is moving in this direction, is really being able to reuse more, to build much better meta models that you can really easily extrapolate to new tasks and don't pay the very heavy price of annotation. I, you know, we're doing some steps in this direction, but I think we are really, really slow. Uh, the second piece uh, in NLP, and I think people are start doing this work and it's interesting work, is really understanding, you know, interpretability and robustness. Because we know that sometimes even the best of the system do some really funny stuff, like all of a sudden, and we have no way to predict. And sometimes ago, you know, Andrew Eng, um, made this assumption, you know, in the early days of uh, neural networks, he said like deep learning is like electricity or something. But to me, it's not like electricity. You know, if I take my computer or my hair dryer or my coffee machine and put them electricity, it always works. But this is far from truth in, you know, natural language processing system. Sometimes it works, most times it works, but sometimes it is like super funny stuff. And the question is, how do we think about, you know, rationals so that they can expose to us more what's going on and communicate to us and enable us to provide the feedback in a way where we don't say go and annotate another 10,000 examples, but where we can really um, understand what's going on and give high level feedback. So I think that these two areas are really important and I think they will, you know, move the field forward. And the final thing that I wanted to say has to do with an open question. An open question for me, because, you know, I started working in LNP in 97. I'm sure some members of the audience were not born at the time. Um, and, you know, people really try hard to use linguistics, really try hard. Now, if you look at the best models that we have today in NLP, none of them for real use linguistics. And even like syntax nobody uses nowadays. Uh, oh, there is a paper, oh, you can use, you know, syntax in some convoluted scenario. I see something very different in chemistry. I see that if you, know, if you take insight from chemistry, it actually helps. Uh, you can build model around it. So my question is, you know, when the technology matures, what will be the place of linguistic? Is it going to totally disappear? Or there will be a new way to think about linguistic? Or can we say something to linguists from what, you know, this big model slam? So I think it's a more open question, but, um, you know, I'm curious to know. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Regina, to give us a very impressive talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, have a great day. Okay, bye bye. 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 好, 今天呢, 我们两场这个演讲就到此结束, 今晚的大会告一段落, 感谢大家, 还坚持到现在, 啊, 一直在看我们这个, 也是非常精彩的环节然后呢还有知识智能的专题论坛下午呢是我们全体大会还有并务室啊有包括Alan 
，还有 g a n Schmidt Huber， 还有杨强教授来给我们带来非常精彩的演讲。我们期待明天大家继续参加志愿大会。明天我们再见，谢谢大家。